And just to give a little bit quick background on the evaluation and learning initiative, as I mentioned, it's supported by the Climate Investment Fund Administrative Unit as part of their learning and evaluation initiative. We, the focus of this specific evaluation and learning initiative is on how to finance forest related enterprises with the aim to help increase the viability and scale of investment in sustainable forest related enterprises by harvesting lessons from different types of financing models that FIP has been used, uh, has been used on the FIP as well as some of the non FIP investments, and applying some of the learning to ongoing and expanded forest investment on the FIP. So within that, the forest related enterprises is broadly defined. It can range from large scale industrial plantation to family owned small micro businesses, income generating activity. And all the speakers later would speak to this because it's really related. The, the, the reason why we define it so broadly is really related to the context of investing in forest sector. And uh, the early learning that Tom will share with everyone just after me is really generated through some of the early work that the evaluation and learning team has undertaken that include one-on-one -on -one interviews, focused discussions, depth to research, and Tom also visited Ghana and Laos as a case study countries. Although you know, because the resource limitations we were only able to conduct the interviews and the learning in the capital of those countries. So that's uh, the brief background for this initiative. And uh, without further delay, I'll hand over to Tom, my colleague Tom to give us the first presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, Jacqueline. Um, so just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Tom Blomley. Um, I'm working on the learning initiative. Um, uh, principally involved in, in work around evaluation. Um, and as Shouting has said, um, I actually had the chance to, uh, to visit both uh, Ghana and Lao PDR uh, to review uh, FIP activities going on there um, and have a chance to talk to different stakeholders, both within and outside the FIP program, to try and get a sense of um, the, the financing arrangements and, and early results that are beginning to flow from those, uh, from those two countries. But, as mentioned, there's also been a number of test studies and other sources of information, interviews, and so on. So what I'll try and do very briefly is, is really summarize some of the very, very broad um, key areas that, that are coming out from this. Uh, they're very early, they're tentative uh, findings, um, but we're putting them out there really to try and generate some discussion and uh, get, uh, get, get your interest. So really the first slide, what I've tried to do is to categorize in a way uh, the principal financing modalities um, that the FIP has been using um, across its portfolio. Uh, and these are not in any way, um, you know, complete list. There are other, other, other modalities and so on. But first of all, probably the, one of the biggest uh, categories of, of investments are what we're calling enabling investments. Um, these primarily flow through um, public uh, sector projects to, to, to government through, um, through grant arrangements. And they provide support to a whole range of policy processes, capacity processes, um, financial de-risking as well to, to some private sector capacity support. Um, so it's those sort of trying to reduce barriers to investment really um, around a whole range of issues. We've seen um, in Ghana, for example, uh, the FIT program working a lot on, on, on tree and land tenure, which are significant constraints to investment. And within Laos, um, there is support to, uh, to, to timber uh, plantation companies around capacity building, trying to help them engage um, more with communities. The second um, model there is, is also a large, it's 53% of the total portfolio. Um, it's really support to very low level, micro level, um, family owned sometimes, uh, informal sector income generating activities. Um, and these are sort of happening within, largely within rural communities around forest, uh, within forested areas. Um, in some cases, they're supported through uh, village loan or grant funds, uh, which are then used uh, through a community uh, process to identify and select uh, income generating activities and livelihood based activities. I think the key here is that 
the emphasis is really on the, the financial support and the process of selection of the IGAs. But in most cases, and this is, this is again a general finding and not, not in all cases, they are, they're mostly around that aspect of, of, of establishing the, the enterprises, but there's relatively little support uh, to business incubation or, or links to, to market and market support and engagement with the private sector. The third uh, cluster there is, we're calling it business incubation with finance. And this is really where um, technical assistance, um, through tailored uh, grants or credit to small enterprises um, is supported with business incubation uh, support. Um, it's a relatively small amount of the portfolio. We, we've calculated around 3%, but the work that PIP is doing in Mexico, for example, with uh, community forestry groups and communities there, but also we've seen uh, a spin-off project uh, working in Ghana, uh, which is scaling up uh, and, and taking the work of the BIP program through another donor, in this case, DFID, um, working on, on a, in a broader landscape area. And then finally, um, investment finance only. And this is really just a direct financing to, um, to, 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 to usually to large scale companies um, involved in generally in, in forestry activities. So plantations, uh, this sort of thing, and generally not linked to, finance, uh, to technical support. So examples of that in Ghana, uh, the support to a, a Dutch company called Form Ghana who are supporting um, plantation establishment within uh, government forest reserves. So briefly, just turning to, to some of the strengths, um, if you like, of the, of the models that we've discussed, I think what comes out really strongly is that um, the, the process of developing national investment plans through a sort of participatory um, process, uh, which, which provides a strategic and programmatic um, flow of investments. I think this is really a, a unique strength of the, of, the, of the support provided by FIPS this, 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 um, in this area. I think secondly, the, the anchoring within national government ministries and, and high up within those government ministries, um, within people, anchored with people who have um, significant influencing and decision-making authority, provides unique opportunities for particularly these enabling investments we've talked about, uh, linking to policy and, and regulatory. If you look at other non-fit uh, financing mechanisms, it often goes directly to individual enterprises or companies um, uh, to the private sector. And this broader policy work is, is, is much less of an emphasis within the, within the activity. So I think that's a real strength. Um, thirdly, I think, by anchoring it within, within a single ministry, there is this, through the strategic aspect of the investment plan, I think in many countries we're beginning to see these uh, external links to other government agencies, which again provide uh, the enabling aspects in terms of uh, policy, regulation, whether it's to do with legality or taxation or, or support through, through other sector ministries. So again, I think these are, these are rather unique aspects of, of, of the support provided. Turning to some of the um, limitations, perhaps, um, I think what we have identified, one of the key areas we've identified, um, where there's uh, perhaps work still to be done, is on the whole aspect of business incubation and development for small and medium enterprises. We've pointed out the example from, from Mexico, where actually this is happening, but it seems to be more the exception rather than the norm. So we've seen this strong emphasis on, on a participatory bottom-up identification of income generating activities, which I think is a great strength, but then a limited emphasis on really providing the, the business uh, development skills, incubation skill, uh, support and market linkages to really enable those um, micro activities to become uh, sustainable in the long term. I think the second area is, is limited support, um, financial services and so on to small and medium producers. So, in general, the, the, the loans or grants tend to go either at the very bottom to the, to the very small scale family, um, household, uh, livelihood activities we, we talked about through village level uh, funds or, or grant schemes, or um, they tend to go to the large scale big companies um, through IFC or through other uh, MDBs um, in support of large scale private sector programs. But, but this middle, if you like, this middle uh, ground of, of medium um, small and medium enterprises, I think we're, we're, 
we've seen less emphasis, and this might be something that we could discuss later. The third area, perhaps where there's limited support, is to the uh, this sort of aggregation function. So if you've got many, many individuals uh, or groups uh, working on particular uh, subsectors or value chains, helping to, to take that up to a national level, to aggregate that to, for example, national or producer organizations, uh, cooperatives and so on, which helps generate marketing uh, opportunities, uh, economies of scale, um, and potential for influencing and advocacy. I think finally, we talked in the previous slide about the strengths of the FIP in terms of its anchoring within government and that strategic opportunity in terms of engaging on policy and so on. But I think certainly um, one area that, that does, does come out is by, by, by linking it so strongly with government, the, the, the links to private sector, it, it doesn't come naturally necessarily to a, to a government ministry. The, the skills um, and, and, and the techniques and tools to engage with, reach out to, engage and enlist the support of private sector is not something which is necessarily uh, a first nature to, to, to some of the ministry staff. So I think this is a gap that perhaps could be, could be strengthened. Going to the, the final slide, um, as Shao said, we, we wanted to throw out some questions that, that perhaps you could um, keep in mind during the webinar and you can discuss as we go through it and um, think about as, as you listen to the, to, the, to the other presenters. But building on some of the key findings, I think there are three questions that emerge. One, this aspect of business incubation, how, how, in your experience, how do you think FIT could better support that aspect of business incubation? Um, to make it sustainable and effective. Secondly, the, 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 the excellent work in supporting communities and households develop income generating activities, livelihood support and so on. How can that be um, really developed further to, 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 to give that um, links to market, to be taken to scale and so on, and to be, to be uh, truly sustainable? Um, for example, this, this, this work on the apex level organizations, is that something that could be, could be strengthened? And then finally, um, where, how and when can, can, can FIP provide support to, um, to these small scale producers um, and their organizations um, in ways that can attract additional financing and funding so that we can once again take that to scale? So these are three general questions which emerge from some of the key findings. And I think uh, I've run out of time, so I'll leave it there and hand back to Shatin. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. And uh, the next speaker will be Mark, Mark from X3 Life. Mark is the CEO and co-founder of X3 Life, a company providing climate smart lending tools to financial institutions. He's a lawyer and environmental economist. Previously, Mark was a co-founder and the led financial product design at an award-winning mobile phone micro credit provider. So he has quite a lot to share with us on the topic of financing for the So I'll hand over to Mark. Um, well, hello everybody. Uh, nice, to, nice to meet you all. Um, as Xiao Ting uh, said, I run F3 Life. Um, which provides tools to traditional and non-traditional credit providers to help them incorporate requirements for uh, climate smart agriculture into loan terms uh, and a system uh, that allows those credit providers to verify visually uh, that, those, uh, that those measures are being complied with. Uh, and just by, by way of introduction, um, I co-founded this, this company together with a Kenyan colleague Obadiah and Gigi. Um, it came out of our experiences negotiating payments for ecosystem services contracts in East Africa, um, where there were two key realizations. The first was that uh, um, uh, when smallholder farmers are under contract for uh, provision of ecosystem services or implementing measures that improve delivery of ecosystem services, they are very responsive to those contracts. Um, secondly, um, uh, the transaction costs involved with, so I guess, sort of bespoke uh, payments for ecosystem services projects often overwhelm the, the sort of the, the theoretical, theoretical good that they do. Um, uh, and really, you know, after sort of the experience of those payments for ecosystem service contracts, we were looking for something that was highly replicable and highly scalable. 
Um, and, and, and this sort of solution that we arrived at in F3 Life uh, was, was, was where we arrived at, um, which is the, uh, the system that we provide. Um, critical to just point out that F3 Life does not provide credit itself. It works with third-party provider of credit, providers of credit to smallholder farmers. Uh, and under step one of our methodology, when a farmer signs a loan agreement, they also sign uh, a, a, an agreement stating how they will manage their land in a climate smart or, or sort of environmentally friendly manner. Um, and that can include the, uh, the, the planting of trees. Um, under step two, uh, the farmer repays their loan um, and also implements the, the practices that were required under their, their, their loan agreement and their land management agreement. So this is where uh, you, you see farmers begin to respond to the environmental conditionality of their, of their loan terms. Um, under step three, our systems are used to verify that those practices have been implemented. Um, and we use a sort of geotag smart photograph approach um, and are currently augmenting that with the ability to use drone and satellite imagery to, to undertake those verifications as well uh, where appropriate. Um, under step four, uh, the information that we collect is then scored um, and then passed back to the financial institution for inclusion within their, their credit scoring algorithm or credit scorecard. Um, and that then affects the farmer's ability to raise debt in the future. Um, and so what the system sort of creates ultimately is a uh, um, the sort of strong incentive uh, for farmers to transition to more towards more environmentally friendly practice, more environmentally friendly or, or climate smart practices. Um, just to sort of point out that what the system also does is that it attempts to de-risk um, from a, a lender's perspective uh, farming activities, such that farmers are more resilient in the events of, sort of climate or weather or environmental shock. Um, Essentially, sort of increases the, sort of the, 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 sort of the view or the information that the, the lender has around that farmer and around their farming skill in terms of mitigating that risk. Um, and that's really what our, uh, our, our value proposition is um, to, uh, to, to, to local lenders, to the users of our system. We're saying use the system to both reduce your credit default risk um, and, and also to uh, uh, increase your client's uh, uh, debt service coverage ratio, which means that's their ability to, to raise debt. Um, but there are several other sort of stakeholders in this who we have to sort of, whose incentives we have to sort of, you know, line, align, um, and that includes funders, uh, and very specifically, the FD Life, what the FD Life system does is create for them uh, an investment proposition with defined financial and environmental returns. And we frequently, frequently hear the complaint that there's lots of money, but there aren't projects. Um, well, we think that this gets around that project by creating, sort of, so I guess, sort of investable sort of propositions, buckets for money to, sort of, to be placed within, which is sort of replicable or highly replicable. Um, and then finally, the sort of the, the value proposition for the farmer is that you know, using use these practices to to, to reduce your uh, uh, sort of vulnerability to, to to environmental or weather shock. Um, and then also hopefully to boost yields. So that's probably what the FD Life system is and what we're seeking to achieve and, and, and how we attempt to subtract users to the system. Um, we were asked to provide you briefly with a, a theory of change um, that sort of, I guess sort of informs our sort of business approach. And this sort of goes a little bit deeper than just the sort of value proposition that I was explaining. Um, simply put, you know, we understand that environmental degradation is driven largely by economic activity. Um, and that economic activity is, is again, largely underpinned by systems of credit, um, which are blind to natural resource overuse. And what we mean by that is that when uh, a farmer takes a credit, um, they're obviously compelled to repay the credit with financial interest, um, with, with little sort of concern given to how that financial interest is repaid and the, the effect of the, on the environment of that. So what we see effectively is that there's a systematic problem um, or a systemic problem whereby uh, environmental degradation is sort of baked into the credit and money system. Um, and in response to that, what we're providing is a, is a system which allows, uh, uh, I guess, sort of um, 
the, the negative externalities associated with credit issue to be overcome um, and to pair financial interest with environmental interest in loan terms. Uh, and, and what we see is that this, this creates sort of a financially sustainable incentive for environmental restoration. Um, in terms of results, we started with a very limited pilot in 2013-2014, uh, which ended in 2015, with 75 farmers, smallholder farmers in Kenya, whereby they were issued with, with credits with environmental conditions attached. Um, and over the course of sort of many loan cycles, they repaid loans and progressively built out soil and water conservation systems on their land, um, systems designed to uh, reduce soil erosion on their land, soil erosion in that area being associated with uh, sort of increased rainfall, increased heavy episodic rainfall under uh, sort of climate change projections. Um, in May 2016, we won the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Change Finance. Um, which threw us into a, a, a I guess, some sort of, uh, a cooperation with a number of the members of the lab, which includes sort of big donors, big development banks, and, and, and some investment banks and funds. Um, and together with those, we are slowly now developing three country pilots, uh, Ghana, Rwanda, and probably Kenya, for 45,000 farmers to receive uh, the agricultural credit that they would have received anyway, as either working capital loans or or input credits with environmental conditions attached. Um, key barriers and risks. Um, uh, financial institutions move at a, at a very slow pace. Um, and yeah, that's often sort of difficult to sort of to manage as a as a as a small institution or small business with, with sort of limited sort of runway essentially. Um, those financial institutions often have a love-hate relationship with funding agriculture and probably forestry as well anyway. Um, often their stakeholders are sort of putting pressure on them to fund agriculture, but the, the difficulties inherent in that sector, you know, they often don't want to do it. Um, and that is only exacerbated by, you know, I guess actually the, sort of the solution that we're, 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 we're providing, the, the challenge that our solution sort of addresses, which is that there are growing concerns about the effect of climate change on, on, on on the, the, the credit worthiness of farmers. Um, uh, some key lessons learned, and this slide just sort of, I guess, sort of presents what we thought would happen, sort of coming into this space, and then what has actually happened. Um, we thought there would be large amounts of funding for innovation, uh, and in reality, there wasn't. But that is very, very constrained. Um, there is a lot of growth stage capital. Um, social impact investors who we thought would be interested in this space have only really begun to turn their eyes to sort of climate and environmental issues. And in any event, don't really provide innovation capital. They provide growth stage capital. They want to provide funds to organizations that are already showing um, or that are already revenue positive. Uh, and the third thing that we thought would happen is that we could raise funds from our original base in Kenya. Um, and despite the, sort of the heavy, sort of the high number of financing institutions there, um, we struggled a little bit because we felt that some resource allocation decisions or funding decisions were being made elsewhere. Um, and you know, what happened eventually was that you know, we, we self-funded limited pilots. Um, and through that sort of initial sort of proof of concept, we won a few prizes, very limited sums, $35,000 in total from Morgan Stanley and Swiss Re. Um, but that was kind of necessary to sort of, or, or allowed us to sort of conclude our pilots. Um, at that point, so the, the fundraising process was so sort of arduous that we sort of nearly gave up. We simply didn't think the funds were out there. Um, but then we won one of four spots within the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance, which then pushed us into, I guess, the, sort of the orbit of, of other funders and large banks who are kind of looking for these types of, uh, um, I guess, sort of, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, defined financial and environmental investment propositions. Um, and, and source of some some sort of promise in what we were doing in that respect. Um, um, that is the final slide. So uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, and we will just now go on to fourth presentation, if we could. And uh, the next speaker is Paul, and uh, from Unique Forestry and Land Use. Paul has been working in forestry for 30 years and has deep understanding of wood value change. 
by the Week in 2016 for initiated and led the Uganda Solar of Production Grant Scheme, which we will share now. Right. Hi, everyone, wherever you are. I'm Paul Giacovelli, speaking to you from Freiburg in southern Germany. But I'm going to talk to you about the project in Uganda, uh, the Solog scheme, where I worked for 10 years until 2012. I've got instructions for time, so I have to go fast um, to give you a flavor of how the project works. And <clears throat> please ask questions later, and I can also point you in the direction uh, for more information should you need it. Right. Um, the background to SPGS. You see those two photos there? The top one is a three-year-old hybrid eucalypt plantation growing for transmission poles in Uganda. The interesting thing there is the entrepreneur knew nothing about forestry when he started before we supported him. And the bottom slide is a community association that the, the project supported growing pines, Pinus carabia there, about 2.5 years old. Um, rotation of course about 15 to 20 years. Right, the background, um, the background um, is that it won't be a surprise to those familiar working in Africa. The uh, rampant deforestation and the timber shortage is predicted. And there's been a heavy reliance on wood fuel, of course. A fast growing economy all needs timber. So there was a huge shortage predicted, and this project uh, was looking, seeking to encourage the private sector to invest in uh, new planting. And it assumed that there was uh, small growers would need financial and technical assistance. Uh, the project's been funded by the European Union since it started um, in 2004. And it's invested $24 million um, to date, with a further $16 million pledged in the next four years. And the, the project supports, as, as you can tell from its name, longer rotations of timber and poles. Right, very quickly, how does the project work? It's a combination of establishment grants and um, technical and business support. The establishment grants on the first uh, side, it pays, the project pays 50% of the establishment costs, which at the time was about $425. So the full establishment cost was $800 and be more today. Uh, but the key thing really is that the grants came, they were performance based standards were clearly written into the contracts. For example, you had to have 80% survival uh, when the program staff visited after three months. The payment was split into three, into three tranches, so we held back some ch the second checks until uh, a few months to make sure to encourage the people to maintain their crops, so quality is the key. There were no funds paid up front. The grants were only uh, paid in retrospect, so the you know, entrepreneurs had to start with their own money. Uh, and we set a minimum of 25 hectares for application, but you could uh, join together to get to that minimum. On the technical side, um, the business side, we had a very strong extension team, which we developed in the first two years with keen young graduates, took them down to South Africa and Swaziland, showed them the best practices, and also we took some of the entrepreneurs down there too to give them the vision of how a, a, a commercial forest sector looks. We ran some very practical training courses ourselves and the team as it was very difficult to find that support outside. We um, published some very practical guidelines after a number of years uh, which had lots of uh, illustrations of good and bad practices that went down very well. And interesting, we um, developed an accreditation system for nurseries and contractors. Uh, but that came from, the demand came from the growers themselves, interestingly, so that's been rather successful in building SMEs in the country. And then finally, we supported the development of a Timber Growers Association, knowing that it was going to be uh, important in the future beyond the project. And then lastly, uh, the uh, land Many people uh, started on government land, getting the permits for planting, but increasingly they came on private land. Right, theory of change. Um, here we are, theory of change. We had uh, identified three key areas, three key assumptions. First of all, that the right incentives will attract the private sector to invest. Secondly, rural livelihoods will be improved. And thirdly, that degraded land will be restored. Now, on the basis of those three, 
you the results. We've got 50,000 hectares established to date. And the scheme, 50,000 hectares, that's about 450 contracted clients. Uh, it's been oversubscribed, and the key thing is that beyond the grant, there's another 30,000 hectares being planted. People often coming for technical advice, not, not just the finance. On the rural livelihoods, I think another success story really, 5,000, over 5,000 rural jobs created, more than 1,400 people trained on the courses. There's benefits to a lot of the villages with the corporate social responsibility or the bigger companies. And uh, in terms of capacity building of SMEs, we've seen we've got 42 certified nurseries in Uganda now and 36 small uh, contracting companies going. And then the third one, the degraded land, well, forest reserves which were degraded are being replanted and the trees, because they're quality and fast growing, are obviously storing lots of carbon. So I think uh, very positive results there. And in addition, the solo scheme has raised the profile of forestry. People talking about investing in trees as a pension for their children, uh, it shows you it's really getting the message across. And it's attracting interest from other African countries. We've been last year advising the World Bank, setting a scheme up in Mozambique. There's interest in Ghana and in other countries in Africa too on this. Right, barriers and risks. Um, number one was a challenge uh, for the institutional buy-in. It's been mentioned already a few times. It's been a challenge getting the buy-in despite um, the pro-private sector policies we see in these countries, often there is a resistance to change. Uh, number two, sustainability is an issue because it's grant-led projects, so obviously it depends on overseas development assistance, the donors to uh, maintain it. And thirdly is the forestry's big uh, bone of contention, which is the long rotations. But the, what we strongly believe is that these risks can be managed by good planning and management. And these risks, I think we're going to talk a bit later, are just are growing the trees, but in particular, the markets for those crops. Right. Um, the working uh, with Unique in many countries, you know, in the last number of years, we're finding that there's a very poor understanding of the value chain, particularly amongst the small growers. And I mean here, uh, product, you know, knowledge of product specification, knowledge of quality. Uh, for instance, knowing the markets, knowing the supply-demand forecast for products is so important. And we here we preach this site-species market approach, where you, it's not just planting trees, but it's getting the market intelligence before you plant the trees, and you can then apply the models that now exist, many growth and economic models, to see if your returns are acceptable for a particular product. So a much more business-like approach to planting, even for small, medium growers. Financing, uh, SPGS obviously proves that conditional grants supporting small, medium growers can work. Um, you might say it's unsustainable because of the, the, the grant uh, focus, but it actually could be considered very cost-effective from the government's point of view, given that it's attracted 50% of the uh, input is coming from the private sector. So it's a cost-effective way of a country getting a core plantation establishment which is needed for, you know, to support the economy. Uh, concessional financing, particularly it's like soft loans, um, have been, were considered right at the beginning but the financial institutions didn't want to touch it. So eventually we decided to go on the grant route, down the grant route. And just interesting, those of you who might not know, there is a study underway in Kenya looking at a revolving tree fund for small medium growers, funded by um, DFID and the Nature Conservancy. So that's going to be interesting to follow. And you know, the, those of you who might not know, the problem obviously with forestry is that banks have experience quite often, and they consider it high risk, particularly for the long-term nature. Even though we think the trees go very fast in the tropics. <laughs> right. Conclusions. Last slide. Um, Solid scheme has achieved good results on the ground. It's proved a sort of very strong PPP, public-private partnership. It can work if it's carefully planned and well managed. And the, the sort of lessons from SPGS for others, I think, is it took this commercial approach, which was somewhat unusual for small medium growers, but it certainly worked. Um, and it focused on the best practices, best practices for growth and quality. So even for, you know, we preach even for communities, small growers, this is very important. 
Um, we believe that the approach will have long-term benefits for the sector, but only if there is more support on the value chains and market side. Well, we've seen this in many countries. And finally, the role of the Timber Growers Association are very important. Uh, and I think we will discuss that a bit later. Right, thank you. That's, uh, that's me finished, and I think in time. And there is an applause icon on the list of icons I'm so I see. Thank you. And if I may just go back to the original question, key questions that we want to explore with you is how can we better support business incubation function in a way that's sustainable and effective? We heard from um, all the speakers that uh, the aggregation of those businesses is very important. And, um, uh, we, we just heard from Juan Carlos that the, the ADEA and the cooperative that they work with were instrumental to make the model of affiliate working, uh, with, working really well. So how do we also, how can they also provide support in organizing community group level income generating and analytical support activities to be quick and scale, maybe two business incubation skills and a market players. So, for example, as in the previous case, you can fit support some of the development of viable apex level organizations for small scale producers, if so how. And the last question, and uh, many of the speakers also spoke to that, is about the de-risking. So how can FIP provide more support for de-risking investment into small scale producers so that those organizations can attract the finance? And we heard the good example from SP Live where um, the contract and the, or the innovative way to monitor some of the activities really help uh, be risk for the financial providers, but also help build up the credit and for, for the smallholders so that they can actually be able to access more finance. And uh, so the, all those three questions are quite amazing, and I hope that you can also think about some of the following up questions for the speakers, but I know some of the audience here also have quite a lot of experience to share with those questions. So do feel free to use that question for the speakers box to make comments and share your experiences and thoughts on how FIP can tackle some of the three areas. And now if I can go back to some of the questions that's already on the screen. Uh, first, Mark, if I can just ask you to address the quest, two of the questions. When is on the F3 system would also work with the conditionality based on forest restoration, not just climate smart agriculture. That question is from Duncan. And uh, the follow-up question on that is that then in that case, could the trees then be used as collateral with your lenders in the event of default? And then there's another question from Achille about how were the farming practices directed and are they based in local practices or simply approved scientific practices? And uh, to link that question probably back to the financing question we're thinking about. Mark, can you probably also elaborate a bit on how you can use That's the financing system that you are developing on the F3 life to incentivize some of the farmers to adopt better practices on their land that, to, that can be inducive for a sustainable business model for forest related enterprise? Mark, so I have to you to answer that two questions. So, uh, the, I'll, I'll take those questions in, in order. So, the question from Duncan, um, yes, our system would work on the basis of forest restoration. Um, I think, I guess there's always a question around you know, what is forest restoration, but sort of skirting around that, um, just sort of caveat. Uh, um, the limits to the F3 life system are that it's only suitable for farmers who are sufficiently sophisticated to, to take and repay commercial debt. Um, uh, and this wouldn't work with, with smallholder farmers who are sort of conventionally unbankable 
from the jargon. And, and, and that's actually the majority of the small ho smallholder farmers. Um, so the, the F3 life system is only going to work uh, you know, within areas where, 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 where farmers are sort of considered you know, credit worthy. Um, to get around that problem, we've actually launched a, a sort of a sister business um, called GreenFi, and you can you can look at the the, the, the website for that uh, greenfi.org, um, and that allows uh, NGOs or similar to place funds within a community managed revolving fund, um, and uh, the community to manage the loans uh, themselves um, and for environmental conditionality to be placed uh, on those loans. And then our system allows for a, a community managed monitoring system as well. Um, and that is applicable to the sort of larger number of, 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 of smallholder farmers or small scale producers who are not, not conventionally bankable. Um, so we've deployed these two different systems. Um, the second, Green Fires, in, in partnership. The two organisations, IUCN and PACT. Um, so that's just, just for reference. But um, absolutely, you know, you know, climate smart agriculture is, is only one of the, the ways in which the system can be used to, sort of, to adjust to small scale producer behaviour. Um, and actually, so the language of climate smart agriculture is very much sort of you know there because that's where the funding opportunities are or were at the time when, when we were getting going. Um, and the, the question from uh, Akile. Um, well, how the farming practice developed, local best practices or scientific practices? Well, actually, um, a little bit of both. Um, uh, uh, we sort of take the off-the-shelf, I guess, practices, um, and then through uh, sort of participatory discussions with, with, with farmer focus groups, we adjust the requirements to suit the, you know, what they're, they're used to and capable of doing. Um, and as an example, uh, in, in Kenya, the requirement was for, for, for grass contour strips um, in, in, in the first instance, and then uh, as, as loan sizes increased uh, for the planting of, 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 sea, of, of trees to, to reinforce those, those, those grass strips. Um, and the farmers themselves were allowed to choose both the grass type and the tree seeding as according to what they, they knew best and wanted to use. And uh, we just got informed that for cows, unfortunately, we need to leave us a bit early. And we would uh, probably before Hong Kong go first to ask a question about the recommendation for FIP on upscaling investment with small medium enterprises in Mexico. This question from, comes from Zelda, and, and it's because that uh, Zelda um, knows that Akile is engaged in some of the activities in Mexico. Could you probably explore a little bit on that question, Bonham? Uh, yes, of course. Um, we, uh, we don't have right now currently an investment in Mexico, uh, and mainly because we didn't have uh, a project developer we, can, we, we know for, for a long time. And it, it seemed like to be too risky for us. If there is a jurisdiction for FIP, that FIP will be interested to, to promote investment, we can, for example, agree into a co-financing initiative, FIP having a catalyzer role uh, f for us in terms of, uh, let's say, first loss or co-financing under a grant base to the project, which can reduce the cost and also uh, uh, de-risk a little bit our position. In that case, the investment decision will, will be faster. What I think is very important, uh, you know, representing a fund, is why a private fund, a specialized private fund, can do a lot of things in a short period of time. Just an example, we deployed 100 million euro or committed it in just four years, which, you know, many, many funds, institutional funds are not able to do is because we have a specialized team, we have boots on the ground, and we can spend a lot of time on, on co-building the opportunity. So I think that FIP, as a, you know, uh, probably uh, as a recommendation, we, we, we could have a conversation, or FIP could do it with other funds as well, as the Moringa Fund, for example, 
how to agree in a jurisdiction, the impact both FIP and the investor are looking at, and then create an element at the top level that then will allow the fund manager to, to deploy the investment. I think it's very important to overcome uh, sometimes uh, you know these, these barriers of communication. In Peru, we knocked the door of the FIP that has been managed by, by IDB at the moment. We couldn't co-invest in this project uh, because I think the area of, of uh, eligibility what, we didn't match. But of course, we would be more than happy to collaborate with FIP. Uh, and this is what, what this the risking uh, OCO financing initiative could be uh, catalytic. May I just ask probably a follow up question on this? Uh, when you mentioned that it's being considered too risky and uh, it will be useful to have FIP help the risk. Could you just expand on what are some of the specific risks that you consider? You obviously mentioned that you want reliable or trusted local partners. And what are some of the risks that Arcelia and your investors would consider when they look at some of the financing for voice related enterprises? Yes, of course. First, we, we love the risk. And this is why we are, what we are designed to, to be additional, not to be like other financial institutions. Uh, this is our mission, so we are really risk, not risk adverse, but really we have a, a big appetite for risk, but we need to know how to manage that risk, uh, which is different, to avoid risk. The way we manage the risk in terms of project implementation in Peru, to be Madre de Dios, far away, with a lot of trouble, is to the project developer. Project developer, grassroots, well-established, 30-year-old operations, very reputable. That's how we manage the risk of, let's say, performance on the project. The market risk, in terms of the cacao, what happened if the cacao didn't work well, and also, uh, what about uh, what about the fluctuations or types or things related to that? We we actually manage to that risk through a hedge, or let's say a coverage, through a USA guarantee. Uh, the loan we provide to to for the cooperative, the operations of the project was under actually was guaranteed by USAID through a 50% loss guarantee by the Development Credit uh, Authority of USAID. So that that support a lot. If FIP can do things like that, will be will be great for us uh, to catalyze, for example, investment in Mexico. Uh, we couldn't make it for for uh, for at, at, on the first fund we had, but we we, we can do it. Um, so the the question is not if there's a risky place. We go to risky places. You know the, the deforestations are in these risky places, deep on the forest, different land use uh, use different land use types. Uh, we just need to know how to manage it. Uh, the implementation risk you can manage quite well with a good project implementator and then things related to market could be implemented through uh, these uh, market, market enhancement instruments, uh, price guarantees, off-takes, um, uh, first loss as well. And I think if FIP, uh, we, we, we would be more than happy to do that with, with them. And so, having said that, uh, as as uh, Shaheen said, I, I would I really need to run, but uh, I was I was it was I was very happy to participate in, in this uh, in this webinar. And please, you have my, 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 my contacts in the which Shaheen can share as well. And, and let's keep in touch. And thank you very much. Thank yeah. you so much, Juan Carlos. And uh, yeah, please, the audience, feel free to. Keep it, just send a phone call question directly, or you can keep in um, putting your comments and questions in the question chat box, and we can pass it on to Juan Carlos as well. And uh, the, probably while we're on the risking topic, uh, may I probably go to Paul now? And Paul, in your presentation, you did talk about the importance. And uh, in the Uganda case, where you actually worked with those uh, smallholders in managing reduce the risk and uh, generate better returns, could you please help elaborate a bit on some of the risk 
that you do see working with the uh, people on the ground and how you manage to relate to them. And now we can go to some of the questions that other audience have posed for you. Thank you. We talk about risk. I listed um, how, ways of reducing the risks for small growers. I mean, they apply to all growers, but particularly for small growers. And uh, what happened was they fell into two categories. One is the actual growth of the trees, the silviculture, which you see, this has just come up. Now, basically what we're saying is uh, quite often uh, growers, small, medium growers in particular, have poor growth and poor quality. Uh, but there are ways, as we've shown through SPGS, of um, improving that. So following the best practices, uh, not just nominally, but you know, making sure the staff, the extension staff are well trained. Uh, contractors, if they're used, must also be trained in these practices. Sometimes you have to bring these in from outside, whether it's from Southern Africa or Brazil, the countries with the big plantation history. Okay. Uh, secondly, fire protection is a big issue. Um, again, for small small farmers in particular, um, you know your investment can disappear um, in an hour or so. Simple protection measures measures can be taken. Um, as you get bigger, you have to certainly plan and invest in infrastructure, train the people, and get some equipment. You can reduce these risks substantially. Uh, and pests and diseases is becoming increasingly important, in, particularly in um, exotic plantations. A lot of pests coming uh, into Africa, into the eucalypts uh, from Australia. We've got to keep abreast. There's no, you know, no need to panic, but good silviculture can reduce that risk by having, for instance, good weeding, reduce the stress in your crop. But longer term, it needs investment in, in research, particularly tree breeding. Uh, and this is, this is really important. And then the second batch of, of risk uh, is, is the markets and utilization of categorizing that. And the fourth point there, you see a lot of small farmers have isolated small plantations, not realizing the implications of transporting their product to market. So it's very, really important. We realized within a year or two how important in the Sorlog scheme about the location of growers, and we stopped. Uh, supporting people uh, in isolated places and started this aggregation that everyone's talking about. So, uh, that also brings about the fifth one, the lack of scale. Um, when you have a few isolated growers, you have very weak negotiating powers. And in theory, the clustering uh, can, can help you, but I have a sort of uh, rider attached to the timber grower associations because uh, what I'm seeing, particularly in East Africa, is you know some good and bad things, really. Their expectations can be very high on these timber grower associations, uh, or, or they can be more like maybe the Uganda one is now developing into a more business-like approach. Um, you know, what it tends to happen is if the donors fund these TGAs, the grower associations, they can sometimes their expectations are far too high. So if you let it come from the growers themselves and, and support it, then they're much more likely to succeed. Uh, number six, low value. Uh, markets for trees. This is really to do with, um, as we said before, checking your market before you plant, doing, getting the intelligence. Uh, I know a lot of things can happen between planting and harvesting in forestry, but still, you can reduce the risk by going for markets which look good. So, it's, you know, 10, 15 years' time, there will be a good market for transmission poles or for saw logs, whatever. And the seventh point is inefficient uh, processing is a big issue, particularly we see it in East Africa a lot. Uh, you get these little mills running around, uh, paying peanuts to some of the farmers. And the reason is they have very low recovery. Because if you have this sort of equipment, you can't afford, and you're getting low recovery, you can't afford to pay the grower very much for his log. So this whole area of the sort of primary processing in particular uh, certainly needs technical and possibly financial support. This series also have a question about the timber export restriction and the small depressed market market means that some of your growers can't get decent lot price. And uh, is that something that the project could have foreseen? And if so, do you think it could have been addressed in tandem with expanding the planted area? And if so, how? Right. Um, a good, good question, Darius. Uh, and if you know the answer, <laughs> please let me know. We are, we are um, dumbfounded. We, it's a mystery why the prices in Uganda for saw logs are depressed. 
we've tracked the prices of them over the years and put, used to publish it every three months in the newsletter. Um, <clears throat> and certainly at the moment, the last number of years, it, they haven't gone up anything like you would have expected from the demand projections. Um, but it's, so it really is, and I don't think the export restrictions is, is the answer or is the reason. It is a, it's quite a strange phenomenon there. We don't know how much timber really is coming in, say, from the Congo, um, but it is a strange. But really, I think it's the, we sort of accept in SPGS that when we started, we didn't do this market intelligence enough, but it, I think we realized it after a few years and started to do that. Um, and in a more general uh, comment to this question, I think it highlights the importance of doing these sort of sector studies in a country. Um, looking at the main products, the supply and demand and the forecast in each country. Um, we did one last year in Tanzania and it, and it really does show you um, surprising things sometimes with markets which farmers think they're going to grow. For instance, the transmission pole market in Kenya, everybody's growing for this and of course, you know, at some stage it's going to be saturated and it's and they're going to be a lot of disappointed farmers who won't probably replant their crops. So these things, you know, you need these sort of fundamental studies, I think, to back up whatever project, uh, whatever financial support is going to be given to the sector. Thanks. And uh, there is a few free comment, uh, further comment in that question box. And I think the key, well, not, if we come back to the, focusing on some of the three key questions we posed about this. And uh, as Evie has beautifully uh, raised one of the common issues that I think are probably all the speakers, including Tom Yitan, respond or speak to, is about the barrier for small producers. One of them is obviously the collaterals, as some of the speakers spoke to, and uh, I guess the monitoring of some of the small holders' activities by financial institutions. So in your view or your understanding of um, this activities and your experiences, how can this issue be resolved? So should I probably hand over to Tom probably to respond to that first? Yeah, um, I, I agree. I think there's some really interesting discussion around this. Um, certainly in, in Ghana, we had some useful discussion with small and medium um, tree growers uh, who were very keen to get engaged in uh, producing trees. Um, there was land available, but <clears throat> they lacked two key things. One was technical, uh, effective technical support, which Paul has talked about very clearly, and the second thing was financing. Um, the, two, the two things were just not available. Um, it, was, it was effectively people financing it from their own savings, uh, from families, uh, borrowing from within their family. Um, but they're unable to go to uh, formal uh, financial institutions and, and leverage uh, financing uh, because banks just weren't ready to look at uh, small-scale timber production. It was too risky, it was too long-term, questions of land tenure, um, uncertainties, uh, fire risk as well. Um, it, it, it just was impossible for people to get started. Now, I'm aware that in, in Ghana, the uh, FIP program has is very aware of this and the uh, in discussions with the national ministry, they are exploring opportunities through additional financing to see how um, some support could be provided. Um, but I, I, I'm not entirely sure how far that discussion has come. Uh, so I think that's, that's, that's really key. If I may, I might also just add, I think there's some really interesting discussion as well um, about you know, the degree to which, um, you know, there's two very contrasting models here. One where you really adopt the value chain approach, the kind of model that we saw uh, certainly in Uganda, um, actually in all the speakers, where there's a very well-defined subsector or value chain that's being supported, uh, which is well known, um, the barriers, the incentives around that are, are well researched and, and, and support is provided around that. And then there's this more sort of open-ended um, community bottom-up type income generating activities and support and financing to that that we've seen in uh, a number of the projects. And obviously both have strengths and weaknesses, but, but I think, you know, um, perhaps one of the challenges with the, with the highly participatory bottom-up community identified initiatives is that you effectively have a huge number of value chains uh, which start to emerge. It could be small-scale livestock, it could be agriculture, it could be tree planting, um, a whole range of things. So 
any any particular project's ability to provide the needed technical support around that sort of wealth of emerging uh, income generating uh, areas is extremely difficult. Um, so I think there's a really important trade off there about the degree to which projects support specific um, value chains and sectors and, and, and effectively say that this is what we're going to do, this is where we have expertise and this is where we can support you. And those that, that adopt this more sort of bottom up um, community driven approaches which, which, which have a huge number of strengths and also provide um, a huge you know, opportunities for building goodwill and so on, but, but maybe less focused in terms of business incubation and, and market support. Great, thanks, Tom. So, um, for the rest of the speakers now, could you if you can address two questions now? One is about still about how can FIP help with that collateral challenge that the smallholders face, and then at the same time, the very interesting question Tom has also posed about how do you manage that balance and a trade-off between the well-defined sub-sectors and value chain approach and a bottom-up engagement approach with the community. And again, uh, all the audience, please feel free to comment and share your experiences in the chat box as well. well Paul, Paul, maybe can you start and then we can um, text Mark the question. Okay, Mike, well, looking at, um, or listening to Tom's uh, questions there a little bit, I think for me, the thing is, you, you've heard about the background to the Sorlog scheme in Uganda, of course, it's not the model that you talk about and the model for the other projects. It's very, they're very, sometimes they're very country specific. And I think from what I'm seeing, there's some basic information you need um, on, you know, land, uh, the situation in for the forest sector, the agricultural sector, um, and you apply these to a particular country. And I think this is what we're finding, that you can take you know, lessons learned. I think this is really important. The lessons are starting to come out now across the board of things that work. And yet still many projects um, start and fail for the same reasons they have for many years. <laughs> so I sound very cynical. Um, Tom, maybe if, you, if you're still online, is there, can you sort of address or let me know what you'd like um, my input on beyond that? I think I think one of the one of the really interesting things that, that you you touched on, um, Paul, is this this whole question of the, um, the 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 tree growers association, the apex organisation. This is something that's really come out in actually quite a number of the um, the discussions and the presentations that have that have come that, through that. Um, and I I noticed Duncan has 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 put a question into the mix here about um, support to to tree growers associations um, in terms of providing. Ongoing market intelligence and business advice, and as well as this sort of broader question of incubation services to growers. So I suppose, you know, it's a question about. You, know, you touched on it in your presentation, I think, a little bit about the the degree to which we can we shouldn't put too much into these organisations. We should let them develop their own um, support and, and define their own objectives. But I suppose, you know, it'd be interesting to know what do you think will be the long term objective of the. Uh, Tree Growers Association, what sorts of services do you think, uh, well, do they currently provide and what do yes, they provide uh, in the one that I frequently turn to, to uh, as a vision is the South African one, Forestry South Africa, uh, which is a growers organization that represents growers from the huge companies, Mondi and Sapi, right down to small growers. Now, you look at what they do, they're involved in uh, forest policy, very strong lobbying, um, government on land issues, whatever, support to the sector. They um, organize training, um, have committees that decide training and even research, fund research. Of course, they give uh, advice to growers. Now, to, to get to that level, of course, takes many years. It's a very mature uh, commercial forest sector in South Africa. So rather different, I think, to what we're seeing um, in certainly in East Africa and West Africa. But it's a vision, and I think it's always important to have a vision. If you look at um, our, my Uganda example, it was always the, we were always asked, of course, by the donors, what's the, what's the plan for the future, the exit strategy for SPGS? And of course, the sustainability of it was to build capacity in the Uganda Timber Growers Association. I think, sort of looking back, that's really not happening quick enough. 
And again, it comes back, there's a reluctance, I think, to let go. Uh, and, uh, you know, SPGS seen as a successful project and um, seems to be a reluctance to let go to build up the capacity of this private organization. Um, I think it's, it really should happen if they want it to, you know, stand on its feet. So, and then what I see, you know, elsewhere where you force TGAs, Timber Grower Associations, it, it, we really do just raise expectations too much sometimes, I think. Um, you know, it's not easy making a profit on low quality timber and, and it needs to be said, I think, to growers. But, you know, we've got to do what we can to uh, make it profitable for growers if they've got the right quality and, and the system and building up some of these value chains. Yes, thanks. And uh, now we can probably move on to Mark and Duncan. I think in the response to Tom's question, Paul also partially addressed uh, some part of your question in terms of how um, they can fund some of the tree growers associations. Uh, if you have any follow-up or specific questions, please do put it into the chat box. And now we move on to uh, Mark to address some of the two questions as well. Um, so the, your f first question, Zateng, is uh, um, how can FIP contribute to resolve the issue of absence of collateral amongst small-scale producers? Um, but I think it kind of needs to sort of look over the fence at what's happening in the, uh, uh, I guess, the sort of the smallholder credit financing world, um, where there seems to have been a lot of innovation over the last sort of four or five years, um, uh, particularly in the direction of sort of unsecured credit uh, through value chain financing, through USSD lending, through the creation of credit reference bureaus, through the improvements made in, uh, in, in the credit scoring of, of, of low income uh, borrowers. Um, but I think you know, what the FIP will have to do is, is start to sort of collaborate sort of more closely with, with that world. It's almost as though they're, they're, they're operating in two different silos, but actually they're often talking about sort of the same things and the same problems. Um, second question uh, is how to manage the trade-offs between uh, a value chain approach of financing and a community-based bottom-up approaches. Um, and I, sort of, I actually sort of wonder whether the two are mutually exclusive. Um, the, 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 the sometimes sort of concerning reality is that small scale producers live their lives in, in debt. Um, and actually, they sort of, you know, from what we see from our research, have, have sort of many obligations to many, many different sort of lenders, both formal and informal. You know, they owe the bank something, they own the, you know, their family something, they owe the local loan shark something. It's, you know, um, and they're only ever sort of underwater to sort of more or less an extent over time. Um, and and, and so, so within that reality, I think you, know, you, you can actually have two approaches to financing. One is through the sort of the value chain and, and through the sort of, the, I guess, the commercialization of certain of their growing activities. And then others, you know, that, that doesn't sort of preclude and more community-oriented financing schemes, such as that sort of provided by GreenFi and you know, IUCN and ACRIS and Rwanda are doing something similar as well. Um, so I think uh, that, that would be the answer to that. I think we are running um, out of time now. So I'll, the last round, I'll just let everyone have a final remark, and especially if you feel like you have any specific last word that goes towards that three key questions that presented on the slide. And again, the audience, please feel free also to put some of your feedback on, on thinking all the key questions in the chat box. Yes, yeah. just yeah. to, uh, yeah. to thank the, the presenters for sharing different uh, interesting uh, experiences um, and it, uh, for me, it was uh, instructing um, to learn of uh, uh, the different initiatives and efforts that are being made to uh, support the smallholders. Uh, but just a general comment, I know we don't have much time to, to have a discussion. This initiative is about breaking or looking at how to overcome barriers uh, to financing SMEs. 
Uh, and the, in uh, our framework uh, of uh, analysis includes uh, looking at what are the investments in enabling, um, creating enabling conditions like capacity building, etc., that you have talked about, both in terms of the technical capacity, uh, securing tenure, and also um, uh, uh, enabling them to uh, access finance for asset investment. And it does um, strike me, and I would like to have a further discussion as we go along with this uh, study, on how do we use this notion of uh, supporting sophisticated uh, producers, uh, because they are credit worthy, uh, to bring um, a, other smallholders um, and, and by using these sophisticated producers perhaps as uh, the lead producers that can, can bring the, the relatively smaller ones who uh, can be managing revolving funds or other means uh, of producing uh, that could um, uh, increase not only the scale of getting the finance, but perhaps uh, uh, addressing um, the uh, objectives that the FIP is pursuing. I know that those initiatives were started with a different uh, context and objectives, but we want to harvest the lessons to see how uh, synergies and, and leveraging of financing can be brought in by um, collaboration between these different initiatives with the, with the, with the FIP. Uh, I think also it's worth reflecting going uh, forward uh, um, on the issue of aggregation and clustering. And, and what I'm hearing is uh, working with Apex organization. It's, um, it's good, uh, but also not so good uh, uh, because of uh, um, the, the unreasonable demand. But I think uh, perhaps here there has to be an investment on the negotiation uh, because the smallholders with one actor uh, one actor each, um, they often, uh, because they lack uh, the knowledge on, on, on markets and even on the agricultural aspects in the case of, of plantations, but also lack the knowledge on, on processing other products that they can harvest from natural forest, they really need um, to work uh, in, in some sort of group, grouping and to, to have uh, institutions that can strengthen their voice. So how do we address um, the challenges of, uh, uh, that can come for organization and, and perhaps strong views on, on certain aspects to um, making sure that the negotiation uh, is in place that can allow uh, a win-win situation in terms of channeling financing, but also getting the results in terms of uh, putting good products uh, of quality to market uh, at a price that uh, is acceptable to all um, institutions that they are, uh, uh, are engaged. Um, and I think uh, maybe I'll just stop here just because of time, but I, I think we, we should pursue uh, a further discussion and also understanding how uh, the, the no risk averse institutions like Alteri are operating and working with cooperatives and how uh, these can be, um, the lessons from these initiatives can inform uh, the potential partnerships between uh, uh, finan uh, 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 financing uh, to private sector by FIP with those ongoing initiatives. Um, so I thought I should just make that uh, general comment, not expecting an answer now, but something that we should uh, pursue uh, with you and the others to as this uh, work goes along. Yeah, thank you. So that's highlighting all those things, negotiation, the importance of negotiation capacities and then all the other key issues that are reminding us that this webinar is not really the end of the discussion and learning. Um, we are only starting to explore a number of questions with you. So if the speakers, yeah, if you also, if you don't really want to directly respond to that three questions, if you have some further thoughts on some of the key issues that you think that the learning and evaluation initiative should investigate further, focusing on some of the obviously thick and thick role in financing, skill up financing for forest related enterprises, please also feel free to share and keep your intervention short. And then I will go to Tom and Paul and Mark. Yeah, thanks, uh, Shaoqing. I, I really don't want to use up more time other than to say I think this has been an excellent uh, set of presentations. And for me, um, it's really highlighted the need to, to balance these 
two extremely complex areas of investment. One, the financial uh, tailoring the financial packages to meet the, the specific requirements of the end users in, in ways that, that is usable and, and, and friendly um, and appropriate. But secondly, this, this enabling set of enabling investments, that's very clearly as well. And I mean, it, whether it's extension support in the case of uh, uh, the, the work in Uganda or, or market assistance as well, um, you know, linking people to markets and providing all these enabling investments, of course, also including broader regulatory and policy aspects, getting that mix uh, in a way that, that provides, uh, opens up opportunities for, for, for private sector activity is clearly a complex task and getting that mix right for me is, uh, is a really critical aspect. So I'll leave it there and, and, and see if others have any uh, final wrap up uh, comments. Yeah, Paul, can we move to you for some of the final thoughts? Thank you. No, I think it's been um, valuable, some interesting lessons coming in, and particularly, you know, this interface between agriculture and forestry now as well, which is going to be more important, and um, particularly, as we all know, the small growers, small tree growers are going to be the future supply, uh, particularly in Africa, given the land situation. Um, so I think we really need to uh, maybe do a little bit more of this lessons learned from these um, and share them. It's quite the, one of the issues, of course, is that people don't like to publish um, bad results, let's say, <laughs> you know, but it, there are times where it's, it's really good to lessons learned positive and bad and negative so that we can uh, drive these initiatives forward. And I think particularly that we need to think more carefully on these timber grower associations because I see, you know, approaches that are not working. Um, in East Africa and some that are working and a lot of a lot of different people competing for this as well which is crazy so I think um, you know the more that we can sort of address this issue the better it will be for the small farmers just to say uh, uh, yeah th thank you very much um, uh, and maybe to just conclude by saying I, I saw there was a, uh, um, a big sort of conservation finance and conference in New York I think hosted by Credit Suisse um, a couple of weeks ago. One of the conclusions of that was the importance of replicability and scalability. Um, now, on scalability, that's fine. On replicability, you know, there's, there's a big question about you know, how replicable uh, investments at local level in different sort of agroecological and cultural contexts are. And so, so searching for these replicable business models is going to be sort of vital. Um, and, and, and that's what sort of FIP has to has to look for um, and the tools that can de-risk um, those sort of, I think, few but, but possible replicable um, investment models. Thank you all for being here and thanks to all the speakers. They spent quite a lot of time preparing the presentation to ensure that we can maximize our learning on this. And uh, again, this is not really the end of this learning journey. We will send you the presentation not including our, including our seniors and the, the audio recording of this uh, by the end of this week or early next week and then that would include the contact information for all the speakers for, for you to follow up and if you have any further comments or thoughts about this webinar please also feel, uh, um, feel free to contact us as well and with that I'll just close the webinar and thank you